Uh, hey, how's it going out there, guys? So, uh, you know, kind of getting another video going. So, uh, you know, in my most recent um, video of basic battle tactics, I talked about the, uh, the, the tactic of defeating in detail. So uh, I kind of mentioned this, you know, just in my, my little whiteboard, my little magnet um, board talk anyway. So I, I figured that uh, this would be a good kind of, you know, good battle to sort of talk through. Um, so talking about the, uh, the battle of Tannenberg and the battle, uh, the first battle of the Masurian Lakes, 1914. Uh, so obviously World War One there. And, um, and honestly, these battles are, you know, the Eastern Front, I mean, even, even in World War Two, but I mean, the Eastern Front in World War One kind of absolutely flies under the radar. I, mean, I don't think that World War One is a particularly popular, uh, subject for most people, even amongst, you know, war nerds. You know, such as myself, I'm actually obsessed with World War One. But uh, the Eastern Front, for some reason, you know, everyone knows maybe at least a little bit of something. They've heard of the Somme, or they've heard of Verdun. Um, you know, they've heard of, uh, you know, the uh, the Devil Dogs and the Marines and the uh, the Hundred Days Offensive and and uh, maybe even you know Second Battle of the Marne, Rock of the Marne, that kind of stuff. But um, the Eastern Front uh, is absolutely critical. So, kind of a little bit of background of what's going on in uh, 1914. Not really politically, because that's, uh, man, I have a book that I still have not finished. It's got to be like 700 pages. It's almost as thick as my fist. And uh, it is all on the political um, happenings within the German Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire from like 1900 until 1918. <laughs> I've been I've been technically reading that book for like four years. Um, it's just... Uh, it has the most information is the driest thing I've ever read. But uh, anyways, back on track here. So I pulled up, uh, you know, just a basic map of the German Empire. So this would be what we would think of as Germany, quote unquote, and the Prussian Empire. So it's very important to keep in mind that at this time, um, the uh, the Prussian Empire, so particularly East Prussia, extends all the way onto the other side of the Niemen here. So past Königsberg, um, you know, which is, you know, present day Kaliningrad uh, that the Russians, um, you know, have kept. And so you're talking about... Um, you know, uh, Latvia over here, um, and then, uh, you know, Poland, uh, down here, obviously. And, um, and so to, to kind of understand a little bit about the, you know, the basic setup. So obviously what this means is that, uh, when we actually finally get set up, you know, for the, the battle of, uh, of Tannenberg here, uh, in late August of 1914, what we have is, uh, we have the, uh, the Russian first army under Renenkampf, and they are basically, uh, they are deployed to and su uh, supplied from uh, Vilnius here, um, which is uh, Vilna. Like, so that's just, you know, Vilnius is how we say it here in America. And so obviously they're going to be advancing towards Königsberg. Um, and then based, uh, you know, essentially traveling to by rail and based out of Warsaw, you have the uh, the Russian Second Army under Samsonov. Um, and so uh, a couple things to obviously kind of, you know, see is that this is kind of an incredibly long and potentially, you know, vulnerable, um, you know, salient flank, you know, however you want to think of it, you know, for the, uh, for the German empire. So people are probably roughly familiar. So the plan for the Germans was the Germans basically knew that they were going to be facing a two front war because of the, uh, the alliance system, uh, that had kind of cropped up in the years and the decades prior to world war one. So the, the alliance system was, was more or less, it was, the intention of it was to prevent calamity. I mean, obviously the exact opposite happened. The idea was supposed to be that the Germans allying with the Austro-Hungarians and then the British and the French um, allying with the Russians was supposed to basically create, in some ways it's kind of supposed to be like what nuclear weapons are today. It's basically supposed to be like, listen, if you attack one of us, there is so much potential downside because of all the countries involved and the size of the conflict that would start makes it, a completely stupid idea and and you know for both sides that was kind of supposed to be the the idea obviously that didn't happen so the the german plan was you know basically their assumption was that the russian empire was the more dangerous of the two foes um, one because the russians had the largest military at least you know in pure size and then the, the Germans had had, re, you know, reasonably recent success against the French. So obviously in 1870, 1871, the, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, the, um, 
uh, the German Empire and what would basically become, you know, as part of the, the wars of German unification there. So the, the Prussian Empire and then, you know, a few German states uh, like the North German Confederation and things like that uh, absolutely slaughtered the French. And nothing makes me happier than people slaughtering the French. I fucking hate France. But uh, anyways, so the, um, the assumption was that uh, the Russians were the most dangerous of the two foes. And so the, the, the Germans could not afford to be bogged down in a war on two fronts. So the idea was that, uh, so they came up with what everyone's kind of, you know, heard of now, the, the Schlieffen plan, which is basically, and I'll probably actually talk about this in later videos, but it's basically, um, you know, essentially be an, an attack in oblique order, more or less, um, uh, you know, almost an echelon attack, an attack in oblique order. Uh, probably, I mean, the single largest example of that ever. But basically, the idea was basically that they're going to attack through France and they're going to have the majority of their weight, their power on their right wing. And they're going to kind of swing like this big, you know, sort of for them, this big kind of right hook. And the right hook was basically going to kind of scrape. So the, the word was like, he's going to scrape, you know, the, the, the man on the farthest right is going to scrape the sea with his, his, uh, his shirt sleeve. And they're basically going to flank the French army in Northern France, Northeastern France, basically. And essentially what they wanted to do is they wanted to separate the French army from Paris and destroy the French army in front of Paris. So they could basically then reach a, uh, you know, reach some sort of, uh, you know, capitulation, armistice, whatever you want to call it at that point. And also they wanted to avoid some sort of prolonged siege of Paris because in 1870, 1871, they did have to besiege Paris. And they basically, they decided not to like destroy Paris um, in exchange for various like concessions like Alsace and Lorraine or uh, uh, Elsass Lothringen, if you're German. So the, uh, you know, a couple of the provinces that have, they're, you know, historically they've been, uh, they've been Germanic as far as um, their genetic makeup, um, but uh, they've gone back and forth between being French and being German, and they're they're French now. Um, and so the idea was to not get bogged down in uh, in a large siege around Paris to defeat the French, you know, and then the British Expeditionary Force relatively quickly, so that they could then put most of the units on trains, send them to the east, and then deal with and deal the Russians a crushing blow before the Russians could, A, crush them, but also, obviously, they need to protect uh, their allies, the Austro-Hungarians. And, uh, you know, so kind of, uh, you know, towards that end, uh, some kind of things to keep in mind. is So basically, so around Königsberg here, the area had been fortified. So the, the Germans, you know, so the Prussians in particular, you know, in, in like to be technically correct, they had built fortifications and things in the 19th century that had been kind of like updated, um, you know, at various points there. So this is a relatively, you know, uh, like fort heavy, like, you know, well fortified area, um, you know, East Prussia was, uh, near Königsberg. Um, and this would play like a large role. And then the, uh, so the Germans had the eighth army that was over here in East Prussia. And it initially was led by a guy by the name of, uh, Pritvitz. And, um, and so their job was basically to kind of, you know, to hold the Russians, you know, or to seed ground very slowly. They need to buy themselves, um, you know, basically a couple of weeks, uh, to deal with the French, then they can bring the hammer blow over there. So now, obviously, the uh, the Schlieffen plan did not work specifically, um, you know, and that's 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 another talk for another time. Uh, I mean, it it borderline did exactly what it was supposed to do, but some decisions made um, on basically one fateful day kind of uh, kind of changed things with that. But, um, you know, so kind of initially, and this is always, I always like messing with people when it comes to World War I stuff, because for some reason, everybody thinks that uh, because the Germans were the quote unquote bad guys in World War II, um, that they were the bad guys in World War I, which is just, it's not accurate. Nobody was a good guy in World War I. They're basically all just a bunch of cunts um, that were just kind of fighting. They were fighting an early 19th century war, but in the early 20th, uh, 20th century with 20th century uh, weapons and equipment and things like that. So it's basically just kind of old uh, Habsburg dynasty, you know, family related stuff and, you know, old empire related things and, and kind of the, uh, you know, sort of the, it's kind of the end of, you know, kind of that period of, uh, you know, the, uh, of the ruling families and the various empires and, and all that kind of stuff um, at the time. And so you're kind of dealing with the last vestiges of what would be called czarist Russia. So, uh, so they're still led by the czar. Um, you know, before they, uh, they obviously had the, uh, the, uh, the October revolution, 1917 and the Russian civil war, um, thereafter, and then became the, uh, 
the Soviet Union. So, uh, so kind of like I said, so kind of we can kind of see what we're dealing with, um, you know, as far as uh, you know territory and stuff here. So the the Russians they actually mobilized um, quicker than the Germans were expecting. So one they they had hid their mobilization, so they'd actually mobilized five days um, earlier than uh, they made like super public, and so they uh, they crossed. Uh, you know, into German territory um, first, which is, that's always an interesting one. I always like messing with people when it comes to that, you know, because they're always like, oh, you know, the Germans attacked the, the French and the Belgium and, you know, through the Netherlands and this and that. And it's like, okay, cool. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm not on anybody's side. Uh, but uh, so go find the day when, uh, when either a Russian or a German first crossed the border into another one's territory. You'll find that it's the, uh, <laughs> you'll find that the Russians definitely attacked the Germans first. And then what's interesting is if you go and read in like, you know, anything on Wikipedia, everything on the internet, you actually cannot find a specific day when a French army first crossed into German territory um, in World War I. And I have a theory. I'm kind of a conspiracy guy. And by conspiracy guy, I think I, I'm just right about a lot of stuff early. But uh, I have a theory that it's, you know... And obviously, so the Germans were attacking through, you know, uh, the Belgium and the Low Countries in order to get to France. So that's, of that, there's no question whatsoever. Um, but the French definitely attacked, um, you know, across the border into Germany, which was, you know, part of their tactic at the time. And, uh, you know, and so they, they definitely made contact in German territory um, first on it. Uh, you know, so that's always, uh, that's always kind of a fun one to mess with people. So... We're going to get ourselves shifted over here. So we're talking, we're not really going to talk about the Battle of Gumbin in here, but um, so we're kind of, uh, this is a little bit of a, you know, the short map to kind of figure out. Let's, um, maybe I'll flash back here actually really quick. So one thing to kind of keep in mind, and this is going to be really important throughout the uh, the whole talk of, uh, of Tannenberg and the Missourian Lakes, uh, the first Battle of the Missourian Lakes, which is that, and this, is, this has been a, you know, the case, you know, as long as war has been around, it's not necessarily, or it's not just having enough people and enough units in certain areas. And at this particular time, the Germans only had about 10% of the, the German military was in the East. So, um, so they're very like, you know, low on numbers, relatively speaking, but the Russians, so they have two armies here. So what tends to happen, and, and you'll see this, you know, it, this comes up in sports, this comes up in the military, stuff like that is when you give a unit a task or a position to advance to or some form of general directive, they will obviously, they will then orient their component units towards that um, as well. And this is where communication becomes absolutely uh, vital of having good, but also not only having like effective communication, just as in the fact that like, hey, I can actually get in contact with you, but of communicating accurately in a detailed manner and, you know, truthfully to the best of your ability in the given circumstances. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that will absolutely slaughter the Russians, um, you know, in this, in this period of time. So we have the, uh, so the Russian second army is basically down and around this area here. The Russian first army is down and around this area here. And so what the, what the basic directives end up kind of being is that uh, first army is supposed to advance to Königsberg and take Königsberg. Uh, the second army is supposed to assist them, but then they basically end up getting orders, you know, or their general advance is more, um, it's more Northwest to a place called like Marienburg over here. Um, and so this is going to play a, a very important, um, you know, a very important role in things that are going on here. So what we kind of see is, um, so Gumbinin was, you know, you know, there's a town right here. So Gumbinin was, you know, it's, um, it was a battle that, that took place, you know, kind of preceding this. It was part of, you know, kind of the initial um, contact with each other. And so what we see here is the Second Corps is attacking down here, uh, you know, closer to, uh, you know, Neidenberg and um, and uh, Soldau, Usbau, places that will become very important later. And then you obviously have, so as the uh, as the First Army here uh, under Rennenkampf is attacking towards Königsberg to come, uh, you know, around Gumbinen. So we can always kind of, you already kind of see there's a little bit of a disconnect here. So another thing that's going on with the Russians at this particular time, and so and so over here is uh, Marienburg. So I talked about that before. So one of the other things that's going on with the Ger or not the Germans, the Russians at this time is that the uh, so the Russians 
they did not have enough cable to have um, to use, you know, like like wired cable communication between um, their their first army and their second army, and then what was called like basically the Northwest Front was what they fell under. A guy by the name of uh, Zitatinsky or Zitinsky. It's kind of a weird spelled name. Um, but um, so they actually were communicating with unsecured wireless sets. Um, and the Germans had broken some of their codes and then they were able to pick up, you know, a fair amount of this, uh, this communication from these wireless like handsets. So it's basically like, you know, Hey, instead of having like encrypted communication or something that's relatively like difficult, you know, for an enemy to kind of listen in on more or less, like the Russians were just saying stuff and the Germans, now this doesn't mean that they were hearing, you know, it doesn't mean that they had a wire attached to their wire and they were just, you know, basically, you know, you're like a little kid when your parents are on the phone and you're listening in on all the conversation, but it means that they're picking up an awful lot of the things that are going on. So um, this would play a, a very big role in what's going on. And um, and so what you kind of start to see here is so as the, the first army, you know, I guess one other additional thing to say is that uh, Renenkamp and Samsonov hated each other. Um, and that will also play a role. Apparently, like, Renenkamp was well thought of as very energetic, very aggressive, uh, otherwise good. Um, Samsonov was not thought of uh, nearly in those terms, and the two men hated each other. So we can see here that the junction between the two armies is roughly, um, you know, roughly, you know, southwest of Rostenburg um, here. So as the first army is advancing towards Königsberg, so like I said, they're running into general fortified, you know, areas here. And so, like I said, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Pritwitz, Pritwitz was the, uh, the commander of the, uh, of the German 8th Army at the time. Well, he kind of gets himself really freaked out after Gumbinen, and his plan is actually to withdraw, like, all the way over onto, like, the other side of the, uh, of the Vistula over here. And, um, and so, the, uh, so the German uh, high command replace uh, him and his, uh, and his uh, staff, uh, staff officer with... Uh, Paul von Hindenburg and Eric Ludendorff, um, who would both go on to be extremely famous um, and very well respected for their abilities in World War One, very well deserved, and uh, they, they turned out to be an incredibly effective pair um, as far as um, uh, you know command goes. And so Hindenburg was uh, Hindenburg was one of those um, you know great field marshals, great. Uh, um, you know, people who had the had the knack for knowing his personal adversary, um, the commander on the opposite side, which I've mentioned in previous videos before. And he was one of the, he, he had very strong nerve and he was one of those guys that had the knack for determining the decisive point and committing fully to it, uh, which I always respect when it comes to uh, not only like military commanders, but, you know, like athletes and things as well is, is there has to be a point when you you kind of recognize like, hey, I got the other guy hurt. Now is the time I have to go for the kill and I have to commit to uh, going for the kill. And Hindenburg had that. So Hindenburg and Ludendorff take over. So um, so his running comp is attacking over here. So we're in late August, you know, basically between the 23rd and the, uh, you know, sort of the, the 25th, 26th. So he's attacking over here and it's relatively slow going for Renan Kampf. But now... Uh, you know, Samsonov is actually moving like fairly decently. Um, and you can kind of see this as like, you know, like wet kind of sandy territory and stuff over here. So he basically gets orders to, instead of, you know, what would kind of be the, the sort of obvious route would be to, hey, to keep a hard contact with, um, uh, with the first army here and to move your units roughly north. So, you know, not shooting for Königsberg itself because you, you don't want to crowd the battlefield with too many units. But as opposed to keeping this very wide Marienburg-oriented advance without having a good, strong, um, you know, kind of a staple to the First Army over here, um, you know, they should have been heading, you know, more, uh, you know, more north and less northwest, given the, uh, the numbers of troops that they had. So... It becomes, uh, you know, so through reading the open communications, you know, they're getting, um, you know, they, they, you know, at this time, obviously, we got scout planes out and things like that. And, uh, and there's also, so this is East Prussia, which means that all these are Prussian, you know, slash German Empire citizens. So as the, uh, um, you know, as the refugees and things are flooding back or whatever, they are, you know, they're talking to the, the German officers, to the military command, and all this, you know, is feeding information, you know, into uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff. And so they basically... They kind of determine like, hey, 
not only is this not a, a catastrophic bad position that we're in, like we might have an opportunity to deal a serious blow here. And so they basically decide, you can also kind of get a little bit of an asso association for the, the rail lines here. And so like I said, one of the things that hindered the, uh, the Russians is that Russian rail gauge was a different size than Prussian. So basically, so up here, they're, um, they were able to come up to basically, um, you know, Vilnius, and then they were essentially like, you know, confined to the roads and stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, for Warsaw down here for the second army. And, um, and another thing that kind of worked a little bit against the Russians is the Russians, you know, in the Russian empire, this particular section, they had not gone and done a lot of, uh, making what we call like McAdamized road. So, so McAdamized road, we, we just think of it as like a gravel road basically now, but so that was kind of like, that was sort of the new rage in like the middle of the 19th century, uh, when that came around is like, instead of just having dirt roads everywhere, um, you know, and if you live out, you know, kind of in the boonies, like I do, like, you know, dirt roads, if it's a little bit wet, like, you know, you'll lose the whole road, rut it up. You'll have to, you know, uh, you know, you have to reblade it, redrag it and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, something as simple as like, you know, adding gravel, um, makes it infinitely more, um, you know, able to handle vehicle traffic and foot traffic, um, which significantly increases the speed of march. Well, the Russians had actually left a lot of their roads, or at least it was kind of the assumption they had left a lot of their roads purposely not McAdamized because they wanted to, uh, they wanted to use that as kind of like an additional defensive barrier for their, uh, Western Northwestern flank was basically like, Hey, we have different rail gauge and all of our roads kind of suck in this area. So any enemy that invades us while we were dealing with the Austro-Hungarians and, and, um, you know, dealing with the Turks and things like that, um, they're going to have a significantly difficult time moving through there. And that's going to aid us. So whether that's a good idea or not, um, remains to be seen. Um, but so they're, uh, so the Germans kind of identify like, Hey, you know, the, uh, they they've lost contact with each other. So the uh, the the uh, the second army under Samsonov has lost contact with Renenkampf. Another thing that happens to Renenkampf up here is as the Germans are pulling back, the Russians are not able to advance fast enough to keep up with them specifically. So they lose contact with the Germans. And I've I've kind of alluded to this or talked um, you know like in my first video I kind of talked about like finding fixing. And so this is very important because like you kind of think of it as like, oh, hey, you know, like we're out in this field and, you know, on the other side of the field is the enemy or whatever. But like often, you know, like, you know, you don't have to be particularly far away from an enemy to lose, you know, just visual, you know, contact with them. But also it's not about finding like, oh, hey, there's a Russian unit over there. Hey, there's a German unit over there. Where is the bulk? Where is the concentration of the enemy at? That's what we're trying to find because you find the concentration of the enemy so one, obviously, like we know where they're at, but that's what's going to tell us like, hey, what is their possible routes of march or what is their plan here? And like, oh, hey, if if their if their concentration is in, you know, I don't know, Friedland or Allenberg up here, it's like, okay, now you know which, um, like which ways they're being supplied from, which rail lines, which roads, things like that. So this is incredibly important. So the first army loses contact with the Germans. And so they don't see them shift some of the units uh, you know, around, they don't know that they're dealing with just cavalry screen here. And so they're, they're kind of, uh, they're sort of just giving away, uh, you know, what is otherwise for them a very good opportunity here, having a, a full two armies against a, a hastily assembled, uh, you know, German eighth army. Um, and so, like I said, so the, the second army has lost contact with the first army over here. So basically, um, so, you know, like 25th, 26th of August is when, uh, is when the uh, the Germans basically decide to uh, kind of launch this major attack. So they they essentially uh, and most of the fighting happens closer to Allenstein here. So uh, so the reason this is actually called the Battle of Tannenberg is because obviously like going back to fourteen ten when the uh, the Teutonic Order is uh, defeated by the uh, the Poles and the Lithuanians uh, is a major defeat for them. So they they want to use this you know this came out after the fact, but they wanted to use this as the uh, uh, you know, as a propaganda victory, victory basically, and they definitely did. Um, but so the uh, so the Germans were able to concentrate significant forces down here, um, and people that you hear about later, uh, you know, von Bilo, uh, von Mackensen, um, you know, very very good German commanders who'd go on to have like larger commands later. And so they are basically 
because they've got these fortifications assisting here and because they know that Renenkampf is moving relatively slowly because his supply situation sucks and because they're running into these fortifications, they do have some cavalry screen and things like that out. They go, okay, we're going to transfer some units down here. Um, and so they, they actually kind of do it very wisely. So they had the units that were furthest away that they were moving move by rail and the units that were closest move uh, via foot marches. So they all could arrive there, you know, at relatively comparable times. So the, the Germans basically begin, uh, you know, launching, um, you know, attacks down here. And so what the what becomes basically the center of the line is a is a small place called Uzdau down here. So the, the Russians basically get encircled near Soldau and Uzdau. And then um, and they're pushed, um, you know, basically uh, they're pushed towards, uh, you know, Neidenberg, uh, Neidenberg here. And so the, uh, so the Germans, they... Uh, they absolutely crush, um, crush the Russians here. The uh, the number of casualties is it's it's ridiculous. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, they uh, they uh, they kill and wound like ninety eight thousand of them. They capture like seventy two thousand and something like three thousand of them get away. <laughs> it's uh. It's it's absolute complete and total destruction of the second army under Samsonov, um, you know, uh, which one obviously saves uh, East Prussia from that. But with the complete and total destruction of Samsonov down here, so Samsonov's whatever's left of his forces basically kind of, you know, end up sort of falling back into this area, and the Germans just kind of basically leave him alone um, because they don't need to deal with him anymore. So now the Germans are able to take these units that were just engaged down here um, and they're, you know, going to put them on rails and everything like that. And they're able to come up here and, um, and then basically, and we'll flash over to our next map. And then they're able to, uh, to attack Renenkampf in what becomes called, uh, what be becomes called the uh, first battle of the uh, Masurian Lake. So like we said here, so we're up around Tannenberg um, here. So the, uh, the remnants of, the second army basically end up crushed back here. So the Germans then more or less concentrate, uh, you know, all of their forces uh, in the eighth army here um, to deal with, uh, to deal with Renenkampf. And so basically the, the first week of, you know, September, more or less, uh, you know, the first two weeks of September, they basically attack themselves, uh, attack into Renenkampf. And they, they basically drive him back towards, uh, towards Vilnius here. And, um, and uh, I believe I called that Latvia earlier. It's Lithuania. Um, so I'm going to uh, correct myself after the fact. But uh, so this is Lithuania, not Latvia. But um, so they're basically able to drive through and just absolutely crush Renenkampf. Um, and they deal him another uh, another defeat uh, similar to uh, similar to Samson. I'm not nearly as complete of a defeat. But so basically, what they've done is. Uh, the German Eighth Army has completely eliminated the Russian First Army and the Russian Second Army. Um, so they've won. They've they've saved East Prussia, um, you know, for the time being. I mean, they, they did save it, you know. Uh, they saved East Prussia, and then they've eliminated significant uh, amounts of equipment and uh, men and material from the Russians. Now it needs to be said that the Russians were actually able to reconstitute. The men, uh, the losses in men, relatively uh, quickly, because at this particular time the Russian Empire has a very large uh, manpower base. But a couple things to keep in mind, and um, and this is something that, that you know it's it, it's as relevant you know going as far back as humans have existed as it is now is there's uh, there's a um, there's a worth difference. There's a um, there's a general uh, you know, cost associated and a difference in the value of trained and experienced men versus untrained and inexperienced men. So obviously anyone who was in the military when hostilities broke out in World War I, by definition, had received some amount of training. Um, so they, they, because they were, they were currently active at the time or they were a reservist who was called up at the time. So it means that they've gone, at the very least, they've gone through basic training. They have some weapons handling. They, you know, um, all the basic sort of things 
um, you know, that would be, you know, relevant at this time. And obviously the quality is going to vary from, you know, country to country and from, you know, unit to unit. So there, there's not going to be any sort of, you could pretty much assume without question that uh, unit for unit, the, the German military was going to be better than any Russian unit. But the Russian units were going to be still relatively, um, you know, effective, you know, at least constituted at the time. So now as you eliminate these trained and experienced, uh, you know, and, and experience doesn't necessarily just mean like, oh, hey, you know, I've been under fire. I've, I've been in trench assaults with this guy. You know, a lot of experience related things that matter are, you know, being able to, um, you know, find, you know, positions to move effectively on the roads, to occupy, to reconstitute, to dig positions, um, and just general, you know, basic orienteering leadership and position management stuff, as well as logistics and things like that. And so it doesn't just mean that like, hey, all these guys have been in firefights, they've engaged the enemy in, in close combat and stuff like that. What it means is that they have experience like dealing with like the terrain, dealing with like the march, dealing with, hey, um, you know, here's how we use a map and a, and a compass and here's how we find, you know, areas and here's how we set up general, you know, company level positions and things like that. Uh, so just having been out in the field for that. So then units that come after that, uh, you know, means that one, they're going to have less, uh, they're going to have less experience at the time. And, um, and then obviously as a war goes on longer and longer, it tends to be that, um, that new troops that are, you know, conscripted or drafted or called up, or even if they're reservists who are called up tend to have less and less, uh, training and less and less experience as, um, as hostilities go on. And so, uh, you know, so that's a, that's a very big, uh, blow. And then, like I said, the, uh, the equipment. So the, the Germans captured hundreds of cannons, so hundreds of guns, tons of equipment and things like that. And this is a big deal. I mean, it's still a very big deal now, but this is, a really, really big deal in the early 20th century. It's even bigger deal in the 19th century because you're talking about the industrial revolution is, I mean, it's not new, but uh, Russia is not a particularly industrialized country at the time, but even, you know, in the Western, um, you know, the Western militaries is you cannot just flip a switch and go, Hey, I need a whole bunch of, uh, I guess I don't even know what, you know, caliber guns the Russians are using. We don't, we don't, you know, I can't just flip a switch and go, hey, we need a thousand new 75 millimeter field howitzers or anything like that. It, it doesn't work that way. One, there's just a, you know, you can only make what your factories can handle at a given time, but also it takes skilled labor to be able to do it. It requires raw materials and things like that to be able to do it. And then obviously you have to get it to um, the unit. So it takes some amount of time. That's a very big deal. So, um, so capturing equipment, uh, one, to obviously use for yourself to, uh, you know, because cannons, they get destroyed, they, you know, they wear out and they have to be rebarreled and things like that. You could give stuff like that to your allies to, to help arm, you know, allies and things like that, or, you know, at the very least, just to keep them from having it. So that becomes a very big deal. So the, uh, so the, uh, the, the destruction of the, the second, ar of the Russian first and second armies under Renkampf and Samsonov in uh, and it's also like to think of this in terms of time frame. So the complete and total destruction of the second army and the almost complete and total destruction of the first army occurred in the span of about 20 days. Um, so from about the 26th or so of August until, you know, about the middle of September, the Germans completely destroyed one entire front under, uh, uh, Zidlinski here, uh, this one spells it as Jelinski, um, which to me makes sense. They're trying to get pronunciations from Russian and other things, uh, into English. But, um, so they destroyed one entire front in the span of about two and a half weeks or almost three weeks. Um, so if you imagine that, so I already talked about, you know, the, the 90,000 KIA, the 70,000, um, captured, um, you know, in just the second army and then repeating that with the first army again, so you think about like how long does it take for a country to mobilize, um, you know, two hundred thousand men to train two hundred thousand men to get two hundred thousand men rifles and equipment and things like that to get two hundred thousand men onto trains onto trucks onto the roads to get them to the front to get them into position like that is a that is a very large um, a very large undertaking and um, and and it's things that you'll see um, you know the kind of you know when we talk about Russian defeats in uh, in 1916, basically. So they take severe defeats in 1915 under von Mackensen um, in the Golitsa Tarnow. 
uh, offensive, which basically takes place, um, you know, right down here. And then uh, they launch a very successful attack, or at least relatively successful. You know, it it, um, it absolutely slaughters the Austro-Hungarians in 1916, but basically kills off the last of their pre-war czarist trained army. And then they essentially are back on the ropes. And then um, eventually, uh, you know, they obviously capitulate in 1917 after that. But uh, I thought this would be a good one to talk about when it comes to defeat in detail. Because as far as I'm aware, or at least, you know... I'm, just on the top of my brain, um, Tannenberg, you know, and then kind of coinciding with First Masurian Lakes is about the biggest defeat in detail in kind of a classic linear sense that I can think of in that the, the Germans concentrated against one element, destroyed it completely, put everybody on trains, moved them around to their other flank, and then engaged another element and destroyed it completely, um, like I said, in the span of about three weeks. And um, I can't think of any other, you know, really like just textbook example that uh, that is larger in size than that. Because you're talking about, um, you know, the uh, the total commitments, uh, you know, in the neighborhood of uh, of of well over, you know, half a million for the Russians, and uh, you know, and a couple hundred thousand for the Germans at this time. So it's very uh, very large scale. But I'll continue to put these videos out, kind of doing. Um, I guess I don't know if battle study is the right word because I'm. Uh, I'm not going to go into like every single individual town and make this a three hour thing. Um, you know, kind of talking about that. I, I, I like to keep it a little bit like zoomed out compared to that, but then talk a lot about, uh, like general implications and, um, you know, just kind of like, you know, a little bit of a, of a soldier's eye view on stuff like that. But that's all I got for tonight, guys. But remember only the hits count and you can never miss fast enough to catch back up.